So let's start with a little bit of delay. I'm sorry, but it's always happening like this. But Markus told me how to do it. So where are we? I gave you already this exercise. And now we will, we will do the first half today. Now we're a little bit late. We will, I will want to do some more comments on uh, general moduli theory. And then uh, in the second half, we will do, as I already indicated several times, we will talk about the endpoints on, on P1. So a couple of comments on moduli spaces, just to complete the picture. So there is a, the Teichmüller space. Tg of Riemann surfaces of genus G. And uh, this was proposed by Teichbüller, but then it was uh, formalized by Bears. Uh, so this is the analytic aspect. So you look at it as an analytic variety, you find to find this Teichmüller space. And here you take the, the curves of genus G, but you add a topological information, a topological structure on them. And this topological structure consists, for instance, of generators of the fundamental group. So add to the Riemann surfaces a generator system, a gamma 1, gamma g of pi 1 x. So x is our Riemann surfaces. Okay. You have to normalize them in a certain way, but let's just uh, do it like this. Then, so you have a Riemann surface together with these generators. And then it was Bayes who proved in 1958 that there is a moduli space, which is then called Tg. Uh, Tg is open. Now we are in the Euclidean topology. In C, everything is over the complex numbers, 3g minus 3. and homeomorphic to a ball. Okay. So this Tg is called the Teichmüller space. And in order to construct Mg, which is the algebraic counterpart, Mg, the algebraic uh, counterpart, then appears as a quotient of Tg, appears as a quotient, Tg modulo, where the quotient is taken by uh, the group of diffeomorphisms via diffeomorphisms up to isotopy. So this was the state of art before uh, Grotendieck and Mumford and Delin and Knudsen came into the scenery. So this is one way to approach Mg, which will be defined later on. And, to, and then to prove that it is algebraic, to see it covered by the Teichmüller space. I'm not going to insist on this, but that's just additional information. Now, as usual, my, my pen is fading out. I, had, I already had today another class. And I was fighting with my pens. So I will let me try this one. <clears throat> so the next comment is this distinguish between, so in the literature, you will find two notations between mg. So this is a moduli space of stable curves. I'm coming back to this in a moment. Stable curves 
of genus G and MGN, which will be the modular space of n-pointed stable curves. We will be mostly interested in M0n. Okay. So what is the difference here? In both settings, you add something, some structure to the, to the curve in order to make it stable. So stable always means finite automorphism groups. Okay. So in the example of the elliptic curve I gave at the beginning at the exercise, you will have an infinite automorphism group. And that's why you will construct families which are not pullbacks of the universal family, of a possible universal family. So let me, let me distinguish now between the stable curves and the endpoint of stable curves. So stable curves, these are, <coughs> they are not uh, irreducible. They have several components, but it is a projective connected curve with at most nodes. So what does it mean at most nodes? I will make a drawing. You only allow intersections like this. Okay, transversal. Transversal intersections. And what you to make it to make this stability condition, you assume that where each component, so the components of this curve, it has many components, could be curves of genus something. Some of them will have genus 0. And those which have genus 0, they must intersect at least three other components, where each component of genus 0, which means a rational component, has to intersect at least three others. And this condition, uh, I am not able to draw curves of various genuses, but this condition on the, on the rational curves, you know the rational curves, they have a PGL2 as automorphism group. But if you intersect with three other components, the intersection points must be fixed by the automorphism. And then you get uh, only finitely many automorphisms. So this will imply stability. That's one way to, so the addi additional structure is you don't just consider one uh, irreducible component, one smooth curve, but you look at several ones. So there's a, a formula if gi is the genus of the ith component of x. Then the total genus, G, which is G of x, is the following. You take the sum gi minus 1 over all components plus delta plus 1, where this delta is the number of intersection points. So now if you look at mg, mg is this g here will correspond to this g. And the idea of uh, the lin mumford grotenik was to allow now several components intersecting each other whenever the, the genus is 0. Okay. And then mg will be a coarse moduli space, this word, coarse moduli space for such curve. Yeah. 
Uh, actually, this is already the closure, sorry. Uh, this is Billin Mumford. around 1970, so the, that's an interesting thing here because you start with Riemann surfaces. Riemann surfaces are just uh, irreducible smooth curves and uh, you, you compactify the space of these by adding curves which may intersect. Okay? So there are two things. You start with an mg and you compactify abstractly, but then the elements in the boundary which appear here can be seen again as equivalence classes of certain objects, and the objects are the stable curves. Okay? So of course there should be more details, but I want to just to, to integrate here. So this is maybe a first, a second, a third remark. The points of a compactification should again correspond to equivalence classes of objects. Okay? And we will make this more precise in the case of MGN, n-pointed curves. So There you will see nicely what's going on. And then we go to geno zero. So now I realize that I can use this machine without making noise. I just do it dry. So I can still speak. And only at the very end, I have to, I have to clean up. That's more convenient. So number four, for n pointed, and let me now restrict to g equals zero. Uh, Geno zero curves. So what does one require? Again, stability means so now you have a you have smooth curves with several components. So you put endpoints on them. Stability means that uh, special points, and I will define in a moment what special points mean, have to appear on each component. So recall, uh, genus 0 curve, this is isomorphic to a P1. OK, so we know already that P1 has a big auto three-dimensional automorphism group. So Special points have to appear on each component. Uh, and how? So in order to reduce the automorphisms, we need three special points. So a special point is certainly an intersection point. This, by any automorphism of this object, it will be fixed, yeah, or it will be sent to another intersection point. Okay. So each component at least three times. Okay. Then you will reduce the automorphism group. Okay. So this will imply stability. So if you look here at this P1, yeah, we have now already just one special point, and we can still move the other points as we want. That's excluded, so we have to take at least two more points. And these are the marked points. Okay. 
And the same happens here, maybe, yeah, at least two, it could be more. No? But on this horizontal component, we just need one more point, because we already have two. So this will be one more marked point. Okay. So now, if you add this structure to our curve, on this p1, you will only have, uh, you will have no automorphisms except the identity fixing these three points, the same on this component and the same on this component. Nevertheless, on the whole object, you still have an automorphism because you may take, you may reflect the whole picture. Okay, so you would fix this point, and then this point goes to this one, this to this, and the component. Yeah, so you you cannot exclude some automorphisms, but of course these are combinatorial in nature and only finitely many. Okay. That's uh, the idea. And uh, this was then Knudsen proved that M0n is, now this is even a fine moduli space. of n-pointed of n-pointed well that's a kind of trivial statement n-pointed rational curves but that's not the interesting part yet you want to compactify okay so let me explain if you take M0n, the elements are equivalence classes up to isomorphism of P1 plus n points n. Let me write it here. Excuse me. Of P1 with n marked points points, pairwise distinct. So that's the easy setting. You just have your endpoints. But when you compactify, when you compactify, I need a new pen. So where do I have a, maybe I try it with blue now. When you compactify, points will come together. Yeah? And uh, if you allow now this picture here, which is the concept of n-pointed genus zero curves, uh, stable n-pointed, then you allow several components. So uh, points may come together in the compactification. Points may coalesce. But it's not as stupid as, so you could say maybe here I have a double point. No, no, it's much smarter. I already indicated this. I will draw it here. What you do is you think of the, your P1 as a hyperbola. On, the, this, on this hyperbola, you take n distinct points. Okay. And then in the limit, so of course this hyperbola is a P1, even though it doesn't look like a P1. Now in the limit, you also take the limit of the hyperbola. I already told you this once. I want to repeat it here. So let me try with this one again. The limit will be the axis. And then you get, now you will get points on different components. Yeah. And if you say the horizontal component is my preferred component, you know, then uh, these two points will still be different. These two will be different. But these two, which are now on this component, if you see them on this line, they have come together. 
Okay, so whenever these two points or these two points come together, what you do is uh, instead of drawing them on the hyperbola at the same point, you introduce a new component, and on this component you draw two distinct points. So that just the projection on the other component is the same point. I think that's a, a very beautiful idea, and it works. Yeah. So I, you don't only move the points, but you take also a limit of the curves. Now, what does it mean to take a limit of curves? Uh, because we don't have a topology, it means that you see these curves as a family. So you would see this as xt over parameter space t. And maybe the general fiber will be the hyperbola. And what will be the equation? So this is here just c, or our ground field. This will live in uh, p2. These are projective curves yeah, times t. And the equation I give you, the affine equation, will be just x, y minus t equals 0. Huh? So that's, that's the escape, the exit strategy. To be, as you, we don't have a topology on curves. On the space of curves, there's no natural topology. But nevertheless, we can define proximity or vicinity by taking the equation and introducing the parameter in the equation. No? And now for t equals 0, we will say xy equals 0 is the limit of xy equals t for t non-zero. Okay? So that's the way how you compactify. And then this compactification here, m0 and bar, is a moduli space of objects which you can still characterize. So I think that's, yeah. That's uh, the, the end of the general part or the first half of this class. So what we will do in the second half is the following. Uh, we start again with this m0n, but we will construct this space differently. Yeah? So here, the objects are equivalence classes up to isomorphism of certain curves. Here again, these are the elements are isomorphism classes of uh, endpointed rational curves, stable curves. Uh, we will start with this one, and we will construct this compactification in a different way and in a much simpler way. Okay. So as we started late, I think we don't need a break today. I will erase everything, and then we will start looking at this precise setting for n equals 4. OK, so please let me erase, and uh, then we will see. So <clears throat> one could say that the lectures up to now were kind of general blah, blah. No, not really, because there's a lot of theory behind, but we did not enter in the proofs or in the technical details. Yeah. So maybe you want to look at it. I think it's worth to look at least once at the paper of Delin Mumford or of Knudsen to convince yourself that it's not an easy reading. They really use a lot of machinery for multiple geometry. And uh, I haven't found a reference where this is explained in kind of easier way. This works also without, without engine. So I think it's much more convenient. OK, so let me start in blue, uh, part two.
endpoints on P1. So endpoints on P1 will correspond to M0n. Okay. So of course up to isomorphism. We're given by PGL2. We are over any ground field. I don't write it. <clears throat> but to get a, an idea of what's going on, let me just start with m n equals 4. So this is a warm up case. So you can see a little bit what's going on. n equals 4 m 0 4. So we have p 1 and we have four points x 1, x 2, x 3, and x 4. Okay. So if they are pairwise distinct, then we, we move them to a special position, can move three of them to a special position, which means via an automorphism of P1. So we take over 0, 1, and infinity. So here I identify P1 with A1. A1 is just uh, the field union a point at infinity. It's more convenient to work like this than with projective coordinates, but you could see this maybe as, if you want to see it projectively, you take here uh, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. Doesn't matter. Any three points, but notationally. The easiest thing is to think of 0, 1, and infinity. So our fourth point here, if you move x1, x2, x3, let me call them now y1, y2, and y3, it will end up somewhere here, y4. We don't know where. Okay. But now it cannot move anymore. No? So the y4 is completely fixed. y4 is determined by x1, x2, x3, x4. So <clears throat> if you want now, this is a kind of normal form. So we get y equals y1. Oh, maybe I should write this differently. y equals uh, that's not very good because let me continue here. If you take y equals 0, 1, infinity, and y4, this will be now equivalent to x, which is x1, x2, x3, x4. And we could call it the normal form. Normal form of x, but this normal form depends on the selection of the first three components with respect to the triple 1, 2, 3. Now, you agree? We said that we want to move x1, x2, x3 to this special position, so this triple is an ordered triple, yeah? and then y4 goes somewhere. So this, as we have a normal form, or we could also say this is a, this is a representative of the orbit of x under PGL2. 
okay? A unique representative. And this shows that the moduli space, hence, simple conclusion, M04, just here I just speak as a moduli space in terms of the set of equivalence classes. Uh, it's just P1. Uh, this last component is free. But it is not whole P1 because Y4 here, Y4 will be, of course, different from 0, 1, and infinity. Okay. So we will get for M04 this isomorphism. But it depends on the choice of, let me call this triple here, T. Uh, so that's not really natural. Yeah, it's, we take a preferred ordering of the component, yeah, but nevertheless, it is something. But now, if you take it like this, you could uh, compactify. So the easy compactification you just take this risky closure inside here, so m. 0, 4 bar, you just define as P1. But that's no good. Yeah, for various reasons, first you have destroyed the symmetry, and also uh, the limiting the elements in the boundary have no dramatic meaning. No good. That's too simple. Okay. What we really want to do is we want to see how uh, how points come together. Okay? So we want, let me call it a geometric compactification. Okay? So Compactification means taking limits. This means to define limits of foregrounds in P1. A foregone is this just uh, four points. I will call them foregrounds. If you draw them on the real line, it looks like this. But if you draw them in the complex on the complex line and you draw it as a real plane, you will really have four points. Okay, and then you will you can think of it as a as a foreground. Okay. So in this picture you see already if you have an automorphism fixing three points, then it's already unique. It's the identity. Okay. So what will we allow as limit? So we have to find the concept of limit. So <clears throat> it's not very complicated what we are going to do here. It's more interesting if we do it in P2. So maybe I wanted to do the case of P2. I have to go here to where I can see you, or that you can see me. Uh, in P1, uh, it's still quite obvious what you have to do. In P2, it's not so clear. Yeah? Uh, so if you think that this is too simple, think of the same problem for four, just foregones in P2. Okay. But we will concentrate at the moment just for foregrounds on P1. So now, what kind of limit could we take? So we <clears throat> let me make maybe a list of uh, possible limits of foregrounds. I don't need the normal form at the moment x in p1 minus 
I will denote this delta. So, sorry, this is these are foregrounds, p1 to the power 4 minus delta. This is the big diagonal, which means xi equals xj sum i different j. And x is written x1, x2, x3, x4, as usual. OK? So now. The first thing we could take, and I will write now ABC to distinguish between these points, we could take the A, 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 A. Okay? So all points come together, all xi go to A. That's certainly the type of limit, but we have to decide whether we allow it or not. Then we could take just three equal and up to ordering we could do it like this. So x1, x2, x3 go to A, and x4 go to B. x4 goes to B different A. This is one uh, a little bit more specialized limit. Then we could take. Uh, a, A, B, B. Now here we have a pairwise limit. So x1, x2 go to A, and x3, x4 go to B, which is again different from A. And the last case is that we have uh, A, how do I want to write it? A, B, so here again, x1, x2 go to A, x3 goes to B, which is different A, and this is different C, and x4 goes to C. Now that's all the possibilities we have to take limits. So now maybe you, to have a little bit of dialogue, you can put on your microphone and tell me what are good limits and what are bad limits. Huh? So we want to, to add uh, degenerations of n-gons no? by points coming together. And what would be a good set of limits to add? That's all. Whenever you, whenever you compactify a space, a topological space, yeah, you add something in the boundary. And what you add depends on your problem. No? Often you just add one point because you want a very small compactification. Often you add very much. Often you add something which is geometric, what we do for the projective space or for the Grassmannian and things like this. Okay. So here, what do you think? What would be good and what would be bad? Huh? So I tell you already in advance, if we just take any of these limits, then we will be stuck. Uh, we won't get a nice moduli space. And already the case of four points is very instructive, as we will see. So any comment from your side? Maybe that the upper two are bad because too many points come together and you lose too much information. Yes, there's, that's a good, good point. These two, you mean these two? Yes. The, yeah, that, that's uh, not good. Uh, so we have, I agree, I will explain why this is not good. What about number three and number four? So, of course, we have to, 
It's very simple. I mean, at least one limit must be OK. Yeah? And so this one is certainly OK. Yeah? Yeah, you still have sufficiently many distinct points. But what about AABB? Um, I'm still not sure on that one because on the one hand you will lose sort of lose two points, but on the other, uh, if you you wouldn't uh, map three points to one and the other just stays out there, but you get a nice uh, get a nice line like thing that uh, it doesn't lose sort of yeah. sure. Thank you, Chiara. Um, yes, some more comments. Yeah, I would say that if you take um, one of the first three um, and you um, do it in the normal form, you can't really decide where the where the last component ends up because the cross ratio becomes undefined. Yes. Uh, so <clears throat> hold on. In in this in the first and in the second case, the cross ratio is not defined. In the in the third case, it is defined. Yeah, because just two are equal, yeah? but it takes a value of 0, 1, or infinity. But there's another reason why we want to exclude this number 3. This is no good for something we learned before. Yes, uh, somebody wants to say something? I can say you something if you don't want to. If we take, yes, here. We would still have an infinite set of automorphisms because we just have two points on the projective line. No? So these three are excluded uh, because it conflicts stability. No? So now we apply a little bit what we learned before. If you just have two pairs of identical points on the projective line, you still have an infinite automorphism group, okay? because you can move a third point wherever you want. So this one is the only one which is good. So the conclusion is, now not just for n equals 4, but for any n. So conclusion arbitrary n. Limit points should have at least three pairwise distinct entries. OK? That's nice. I mean, easy argument. And if it, if the limit point has three pairwise distinct entries, then it has again a normal form. And in this way, it has a normal form. But take care here. The normal form, remember for the foregone, we chose one, two, three as our distinguished entries. Now here, the three distinct entries correspond to a triple. If t equals i, j, k is a triple with x, i, x, j, x, k pairwise distinct, then our normal form will have y1, and then we go to yi minus 1. Let's assume that i less than j less than k to simplify our life. No? So now here we will have 0 in the i's place. Then we have yi plus 1, yj minus 1, 1, yj plus 1, yk minus 1, infinity yk plus 1 up to yn. OK? So that's a mess. That's a mess because <laughs> when we take, we have used normal forms when all entries are pairwise distinct. And now we have 
according to each triple, we have different normal forms. Okay. So that's one observation, and we will solve it easily. Yeah. Uh, the second thing is what I want to show you. Uh, let us focus again n equals 4. Let us now compute a concrete limit. Computation of limits. But now I take something a little bit more sophisticated. We will take limits of orbits, of PGL2 orbits. So recall, we have one foregone. Yeah? We have its orbit, which I draw like, uh, like this, no? under PGL2. And then for each point in the orbit, we may take a limit. And it's not clear if the limit of each point of this orbit is the same, which means if the limits of the points of the orbits are in the same orbits. Okay, so let me write this down. So the question is: Are limits of points of same orbit again in a same in a common orbit? So let us do this in the example. So we will focus on this case here. Now, I hope that you find this interesting. I find it uh, quite amusing. We take the following xt. Now, t is a parameter. We take already a normal form 0, 1, infinity, and t. That's a foregone. t is in the ground field. Okay, And this is equivalent under PGL2. So I think this should be an exercise which you are invited to do. You keep 0, but here you move it to t minus 1, 1 over t, infinity and 1. Okay, So here we have two different normal forms. Ah, maybe this t is not good, because t will be reserved for triples. But now it's already there. OK. So I don't write. The triple here would be 1, 2, 3. And here it would be uh, 1, 4, 3. Huh? At place 1, we have 0. At place 4, we have 1. At place 3, we have infinity. Huh? Now let's go with t to infinity. So this is equivalent for t different 0 and infinity. Now we want and 1. Uh, 1 does not mat matter, but uh, we want to have four distinct points. Now let's take, let's go with t to 0. So that's easy. X, I just write x0 is 0, 1, infinity, and 0. So you see that now two entries are the same, but we have still three pairwise distinct entries. And y0 is 0, uh, infinity, infinity, and 1. And now exercise, these two are not equivalent. So x0 is not PGL2 equivalent to y0. OK, exercise. So that's kind of surprising, no? So let me draw this. I don't know how my, my orbits are not very, very, uh, no. 
So this we, we have here the orbit, we have here x, t, and y, t. And then in the limit, now maybe I should not draw this. Uh, x t and y t goes. This goes to y zero and x zero. And if we let me draw it like this here. And now the orbits are distinct. Can you see this? I hope so. Yeah. Distinct orbits. So let us, I'm, I'm going slowly, but I think it's, it's really basic and it's also interesting because it has a philosophical touch. Now we think about what is limit, what does it mean to take limits of equivalence classes. No? What it means is here that if you take here equivalent objects, no? here equivalent n-gons, you should add different limits. Yeah? Not just one for one orbit, but one orbit may give rise to several orbits in the limit. Okay? So in the moduli space, uh, it's not just a, that you add, it, you add for each orbit in, in p1 minus here, no? you add one limit point. But you add several ones. Yeah? Here you have, we have two limit points, but we could have more. Okay? So that's a subtle matter. And uh, funny enough, there's an answer which is very satisfactory and, actually, and even easy. Okay? So <clears throat> uh, what about our time? Oh, we still have 25 minutes. Are you tired already? Shall we make a break? You can, I mean, I think we can continue some more 20 minutes and then we'll see. So, some in the, in the paper of Behrendt, in the article of Behrendt I mentioned, this type of limits uh, is discussed. You also find it in other papers, but you don't find it in the original papers. Yes, just a moment. Yes, please. Um, yeah, I was just... Um Yes, so <coughs> we will see that afterwards it is, it is functorial. Yeah? It, it looks a little bit discontinuous, but a posteriori the construction is so natural that you will be convinced that it is the correct one. Okay? Uh, but that's a point we might, I will maybe I discuss it next time. I cannot give you a precise answer at the moment. Yeah? But the good, good observation. So let me write this down. What Powell meant that uh, is, you want to say that the limit, taking the limit is not compatible with the PGL2 action in some sense. No? So question, continuity or compatibility between PGL2 action and limits. So, <laughs> by the way, that's a very good, that's a very good observation because look at this again. 
let's um, uh, note x0 and y0 are not equivalent, but they share something. They have they are not arbitrarily. Yeah? They have something in common. They have something in common. And that's the replacement of this compatibility with PGL2. And it is given by continuity because both limits, both xt, yt, are continuous families. So what do they share? Maybe you, we could make a competition, actually. Everybody is invited to write it in the chat, but this never works. So they share something. So here, as, t, as long as t is distinct, uh, this one was yt. I did not write it. Sorry. Yeah. Why didn't I write this? Here, this is yt. No? So xt is equivalent to yt for t different 0 and infinity, and 1 if you want. Hence, as they are equivalent, now, I mean, you should almost guess what is happening now. As they are equivalent, their cross ratio is the same. Cross xt. So we just have four entries, so we have a unique cross ratio equals cross yt. But cross is a rational function in the four entries. No? So this implies this is preserved in the limit. So cross x0, which is the limit, will also be cross y0 in the limit. Okay. So this gives you immediately a candidate for the compactification. Candidate for compactification. Let me do it directly for m0 n, n points, arbitrary n. What do we take? We take we have two two requirements. The boundary, so let me write it x in m0 n bar minus m0 n. This will be a limit point, although you could call it a boundary point. This is usually denoted by B0n, boundary. The limit point, it should have three different pairwise distinct entries, is subject to uh, x has at least three pairwise distinct entries, one condition. And the second condition, I cannot make it precise. The cross ratios are OK. Are preserved. if x, y are limits of points 
of the same orbit. That's still a little bit vague, but I, I believe that you understood what I mean here, at least. No? So we have a condition on the cross ratios and three distinct entries. So I don't want to sell all my, all my goods uh, in the first day of this the first class of this more specific section. Uh, how shall I do? Yeah, maybe I write it like this. The problem is, so I, what I would like to do is today, I want to give you a lot of ideas and hints how to think about it. But then I would like to give you one week to think about it yourself and not just to throw all the answers on you today. No? So we have, uh, we have several problems. First, we have to make this precise. So let me call this A and this B. Make, oh, that's not good. Let me call it 1 and 2. One and two. It's one cannot dry this. It's a little bit so. Make two precise. The next problem is uh, we want to make the normal form, which we will certainly use in some place. We want to make it independent of our triples. Make normal form of n gon independent of choice of triple. And C, more generally, we already know what uh, m0n is. So uh, realize so m0n, we just did the, the exercise before, and realize this inclusion. in the compactification. We want to realize this by defining the elements here you know, in the compactification as objects. Yeah? By defining the points of m0n bar. We cannot, we cannot say we take just limits, yeah, because we don't know where we are. I mean, the example here, the limit was given by letting go, t go to 0 or infinity. But if we have abstract n-gons, yeah, what does it mean to take a limit? Okay. So all three problems will be solved in one stroke. Okay. Uh, but I don't tell you today. I think I mentioned it already in my in my lecture, but uh, for this book. But I want to skip it today. So <clears throat> let's leave this for next time. So what could I what could I tell you more? Maybe just to 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 end today. Let me talk a little bit about PGL2. 
We have seen this already several times. So PGL2 is either you see it as a Lie group. Yeah, let me say it like this, PGL2. That's, as we said already, this is SL2K up to plus minus 1. And it is the same as GL2K up to K star. So the elements are matrices A, B, C, D. This has nothing to do with the A, B, C we had before. Uh, a, B minus C, D equals 1. But we have to take out plus minus 1 because note that uh, minus A, minus A minus B minus C minus D will also have satisfy this property. And uh, A times Z equals minus A, Z. So this is, of course, AZ plus B Möbius transformation, ZZ plus D. And this would be minus AZ minus B divided by minus CZ minus D. Okay. So if you want to look at it as an algebraic variety or as a Lie group, depending on your field, PGL2 is three-dimensional. algebraic group you can also see it as a group scheme if you want it is three dimensional and it is affine affine means it is, sits inside four dimensional affine space okay at the hypersurface now the orbits of x. Now let's go to arbitrary n. We take again p1 n minus the big diagonal. So that's something which is now a little bit of group theory which comes into play. The orbits of x, if all entries are distinct, pairwise distinct, then the orbits will be three-dimensional. Will be three-dimensional and smooth varieties. Yeah. Orbits are always smooth uh, under the action of algebraic groups. So this does not uh, will not work in the limit, but the orbits of limit n guns may have smaller dimension. For instance, if we take the example from before, what was it? Zero, it doesn't matter. x equals 0, 1, infinity, 0. This, we agreed that this would be an accepted point in the boundary, m0, 4, bar. So what is the dimension of the orbit? VGL2 times x. Uh, I would say that it is less than 3. But I don't see it clearly. Maybe we leave this as a homework to discuss this, OK? And maybe another homework exercise 
<coughs> we did n equals 4, and we considered what could be possible limit. Uh, describe the good limits. Good is a word you should never use in mathematics except today. Describe the good limits of five cons in P1. Okay. So let's now make a list. So again, we will have, for instance, A, B, C, three distinct ones, and then you could A, A. Now this would be one, but you may also vary. And you get a finite list of possible limits. And once you do this type of examples, you will get a feeling how to, how to see this embedding here, how to construct the compactification. Okay. So I think that's all for today. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you enjoy this a little bit because uh, it's, it's elementary geometry, but it's a mixture of various things, a little bit of algebraic geometry, group theory, projective geometry, uh, and combinatorics. Combinatorics will come into play next week. So thank you for joining. Have a wonderful evening. And we meet hopefully next week again on Tuesday. Bye bye. Bye, thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you, bye. <laughs>